just form a fucking wall. O'Neal deep in the post, lots of contact there. Oh, what a block by Wallace what? on a jump ball. Pistons down four, 12-8, 7-38 to play the first one. Hey, hey, hey. Burst from Rossi, stuck into the rim. Count them, baby, and a foul. Reggie inside for Andre, oh. and a dynamite dunk. Pistons fans, welcome back to another edition of the Dallas Pistons podcast. I'm your host, Mike Angolano, and joining me as always is Aaron Johnson. Aaron, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, Mike. You know, probably internally, I'm a little little upset at myself being a little late to the recording. I thought we had a different, you know, different <laughs> schedule set up for this, so I'm a little bit late. I feel like an idiot, uh, but as always, I'm charged up, ready to talk about the Pistons. Yes, you're not late. I was just fashionably early. That's all. <laughs> That's okay. You know, I get off of work at four o'clock and like, all right, what's next? What's my next task? And I had podcast on the mind, but I just slow to have a little hour break. break. You have that go getter mentality. And <laughs> I just completely listless. I just killed an hour of your day. So no, no, no. You're you are you're a okay on that front. But we do have a lot to get to. A lot has happened. Um, we didn't really feel like it made a lot of sense to have a deadline pod because the Pistons were underwhelming in the sense that they did not make many moves. Um, so we felt like it was kind of pointless to have a DeLon Wright podcast. Uh, so we are going to recap the trade deadline. There was a lot of small moves, which I kind of figured was going to happen. A couple of big moves that we can touch on just a little bit, but we want to focus on the Pistons and the Pistons trade. Uh, really the only one, actually the only one was uh, DeLon Wright for Corey Joseph and a second round pick. That was a Pistons Kings swap. Detroit sent DeLon Wright out to Sacramento for Corey Joseph and a second round pick. Maybe the most inconsequential move of the entire draft because I don't think it I think it saves the Pistons a little bit of money and they get a second round pick and the Kings do something. Although I guess I can't argue. They, they I think they won five and six or something now. So who am I to argue? Um, Aaron, what do you think about this trade? Do you think it's as inconsequential as I think it is? It is rather meaningless of a, as a trade, in my opinion. Um, you know, that's not against DeLon Wright. He played pretty good basketball here in Detroit. He obviously really liked it here, as you could uh, see in his goodbye post, something that he actually did after being with the team for a few months, unlike a certain other Piston, more prominent Piston that – had been with the organization for <laughs> for a couple of years, uh, but you know Wright really enjoyed his time in Detroit, and he was a pretty productive player here. Had was playing a very c- consistent and solid stretch of basketball. You know, came to the team at the start of the season. It looked like it was going to be more of a two guard role for him, playing alongside the rookie point guard Killian Hayes, and you know, just kind of trying to be a stopgap there and a developer and a veteran around him, you know, as a guard uh, to help mature him quickly. And once Hayes went down, that quickly changed into DeLon Wright becoming the starting point guard for the Detroit Pistons. And he pretty much blossomed in that role. And it was a very competitive player for a team that has been rather competitive this year. Uh, So he has, you know, he boosted his value as a player. Obviously, at his age, it's not an upside play. It's a right now talent acquisition play with him, and he's going to help the Kings in that regard. But for the Pistons, they get back Corey Joseph. That's essentially free money next year as it frees up some cap space, and they're able to get a second round draft pick back, which you can't ever, uh, you know, be disappointed in if you're Detroit. I mean, it, this trade even happened at like one o'clock in the morning. It happened at like such an inconsequential time of the day too. Um, one o'clock in the morning, East Coast, I guess. That was on the West. That 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 was the first deal of the deadline, and it was um, uh, it was just as pointless as the first deal normally is, just to get things rolling. I don't exactly know, and and Tim Forkin has mentioned this in our group chat as well. I don't understand why the Pistons are moving to get additional cap space unless they're angling to play the Brooklyn Nets 2016 or maybe it was that 2017. Whenever they gave that massive contract, Tyler Johnson gave that massive contract to Alan Crabb. 
that that big offer sheet and then forced other teams to either suck it up and accept that offer sheet and match it or let them walk. I don't know if they're trying to do that or if they legitimately are just going to pick every second round pick off the bottom of the trash can and try to find some value out of it, whether they combine those seconds to move up into an early second round pick or a late first round pick. It was a very strange move because I thought the line right was helpful for this team. And Dennis Smith Jr. immediately gets hurt. So now we've gone from having an open, like a surplus of point guards to having to throw Saban Lee as a starting point guard. I don't understand why they're trying to clear cap space. And we can get into the moves that we don't understand the Pistons doing later because there are a couple of other disappointing or um, questionable decisions perhaps from Troy Weaver. I don't understand why they're clearing cap space base necessarily yeah i don't know if he's going for the whole uh you know trying to mimic sam presti in oklahoma city but the problem with that is oklahoma city's also been getting first round picks and detroit doesn't have that kind of stash uh, right. in regards to first round picks so you know, i'm not against opening up cap space and getting back a second round pick for a guy that you know probably isn't a major part of your franchise down the line anyway. Uh, I will say I'm not exactly sure what they're going for with the cap space. However, you know, we didn't expect Detroit to go out and sign guys like Jeremy Grant and Mason Plumley this past off season. So, you know, maybe oh, Troy true. Weaver is going to be looking at some guys and maybe he's trying to free up some money to, you know, have money available to extend, a guy like Hamidou Diallo, who we're going to talk about here shortly. I mean, I think there's a couple different uh, things in play there, but it's interesting because it, it it feels like the team should just kind of be the team after all of these moves. It really just feels like, all right, let's maybe settle back on the moves and, and let's see what this group does for a little bit. How do they develop? How do they play? And, and, and okay. things like that. But the cap space clearing up, Joy Weaver mentioning that no one is safe on this roster. You know, it makes you think he still might have some more plays up his sleeve. Oh, I think he does. Uh, I, I, I definitely think he does. I think he could be doing that Brooklyn Nets. Let's hand an offer sheet to every restricted free agent and make the other team match um, like the Brooklyn Nets did. And Jared Allen, I'm sure they're going to want to go after. They were interested in him. Previously, the Cavs, I think, are going to match pretty much anything that comes their way. John Collins is somebody that could fit right in at power forward for the Pistons and immediately inject um, some real athleticism into that starting lineup. And he's been playing really well, and Atlanta's been playing really well. Um, they're on a little bit of a slide now, but they were playing really well. They jettisoned themselves up into the top six of the East so that they could throw something at him enforce Atlanta's hand, which is interesting because I think that it would force their hand to match because I don't think they can necessarily just give up on John Collins because he's been so important to their mini resurgence here to get them back into the playoffs. So I think it's definitely possible that he's going to go the Brooklyn Nets route and throw out some offer sheets. Um, and, you know, that's, that's fine. If that's what it's going to be to put the other teams in salary cap hell, while you still have a relatively clean bill of health, then so be it. And you get a second round pick. I mean, you could always package a couple of those seconds and move up in the draft um, if you really have a guy that you like. And it seems like they're pretty pretty capable of finding hidden gems, guys that we didn't really talk about much before the draft, like Isaiah Stewart or Saban Lee, who's looked okay, and Sadiq Bey obviously looks, looks very good. So... Um, DeLon Wright for Corey Joseph in a second. I don't really want Corey Joseph taking much time away from the young guys either. So that's another thing to monitor. Moving forward, I'd rather he nail himself to the bench and just kind of hang tight, get paid, and go to another team in the offseason. Um, but let's talk about two two names that I for sure, I for sure thought one of them was going to be gone. And he wasn't. And I think we were all a little stunned. Um, the Pistons did not trade Wayne Ellington. They also did not trade Mason Plumley. And I don't remember what guesses we made for draft or for, for uh, trades, who was going to get traded. I think I shot the over, but I don't remember. Um, 
Aaron, what do you think about Wayne Ellington not being moved, Mason Plumley not being moved? I think Plumley was a player that I least expected to get moved. But I was definitely shocked to see no trade come in for Ellington. I was, you know, I figured it may, you know, even come down to the wire of, you know, a team having to talk themselves into giving up a second round pick or a pair of second round picks right up towards the end of the, you know, deadline uh, to bring in Ellington and his shooting and scoring ability. But it never happened. And and what I'll say to this is I, I was really, really happy to see afterwards that it was reported that the Pistons were going to move forward with Ellington on the roster and they were not going to buy him out because that's Troy Weaver sending a message. You know, that's him saying, I'm not just going to give you someone for free. You're going to have to pay for it or we're just going to make it work here. You know, Wayne Ellington is absolutely fine playing on the Pistons. He provides shooting. He provides scoring. He provides veteran stability he provides mentorship. I'm completely fine with holding on to him. Uh, you know, since the Pistons were not able to get a deal for him, I don't think it would make any sense in the world for them to go all up to the deadline trying to trade this guy on a bare minimum contract, and when no deal's there for them, just to cut him because that sends a message of, well, we're not. Don't worry about it. If we're not able to get a deal, we're just going to buy the guy out. And a guy like Ellington, who's able to play provides value is worth keeping around because it sends the message for the next go around. When you have a player that you're willing to move at the deadline, the other teams want. And if they're guys that could be maybe fringe buyout candidates, it's going to send the message of, look, we're not just going to buy this guy out for you. If you really want him, if your team really wants him, you're going to have to pay for it. So I really like that decision by Troy Weaver. I think it sends a clear message to the rest of the general managers and front offices around the league. I would have preferred Ellington to be moved, but it is, it's really not that big of a deal that they kept him. They were still able to get a second round pick for DeLon Wright. So they got some sort of asset at the deadline. I'm really okay with that. And Mason Plumlee, that's a guy that I'm really not opposed to seeing stick around in Detroit even if next year it's in a smaller role he just comes out and does his job on a nightly basis he 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 handles the ball a little bit more than maybe you'd like for a center but it's because he has that ability and he's just a a solid presence he'll get you some points he's going to work on the glass he's going to give you some hard fouls and I don't mind a backup center like that And, and and next year if that's the role that Plumley is in. I think that's a perfectly fine role. He's making, you know, seven, eight million dollars a year. It's not great that you're paying him that much, but it's also not the end of the world. So I was definitely shocked to not see Ellington moved. I'm okay with that. Uh, I was not shocked to see Plumley didn't get moved. And again, I'm okay with that one too. I think it's important. And I just want to go back to Wayne Ellington just real briefly. You know, I think some of us, and I, I like to think I'm in the more the analytical side of NBA Twitter. There are guys that are just purely, give me the give me the guy who puts the ball in the hoop, no questions asked. I don't care about his true shooting. I don't care about his effective field goal, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think that sometimes we get a little bit, and I'm not going to lump you in with analytical Twitter. I don't know where you fall on the analytic spectrum, but I think we kind of, Um, try too hard to squeeze every last bit of value out of a player because Wayne Ellington might be the only guy, the vet that you can count on to shoot the basketball on this team right now. Like Jeremy Grant is very good, but you need a, a guy like Wayne Ellington. You need someone to take shots. Jeremy Grant can't take every shot. Sadiq Bey can't take every shot. You need other guys to take shots. And if you, sort of let him go. I think that could, could also send a bad message to the rest of the team. Like, you know, I think it's beneficial to have vets on a really young team like that. It's, you don't, we don't have to squeeze every single piece of draft value, draft capital out. We don't have to save every single penny. I think, you know, well, Wayne Ellington, his contract is insignificant. But his value to the team to just take shots, be a veteran presence, finish out the year on a bad team. The Pistons, like you said, don't buy him out. I think that's really important. You know, these small market teams right now are just getting 
blasted um, by cutting players, getting rid of players, buying them out, being unable to find a trade because no one will give anything up for them. And then they just immediately go sign with the bigger market. I think it sends a message that the Pistons don't buy them out. They don't settle for, you know, a, a bad, a bad trade. And they keep a guy on the team who's a vet, who is going to take shots, who, you know, could get hot one night and put you in the win column. And, you know, he's probably gone next year. I don't think they're going to keep him around, but I think it's important to still have a guy like him on the roster, if that makes sense. No, I, and, and that's a point that I was trying to make that a, to a couple of people that had texted me following the trade deadline. They're like, well, why, why didn't the Pistons move Wayne Alec? And I thought he was gone. Like I thought they were getting picks for him. And, you know, I understand the, the, mentality of everyone's got to be worth an asset. Everyone's got to be worth a pick. Your team's rebuilding. That guy doesn't matter. He's not playing on your team when you're competing in the playoffs down the line. I get that perspective. It's not entirely right, but I understand it from a fan who just, you know, is thinking about the future and wanting to see a better version of the team and thinking that these guys are going to get moved for, you know, all these different picks and whatnot. And they're all worth this set value every trade deadline this guy is going to be worth a second round pick well this guy is worth a first round pick it just doesn't work like that and you know I, again I, I, that's what I said I said it's okay for a guy like Ellington to be on the team because he's going to provide some stability and look at this team look at how many non-shooters there are on this team Wayne Ellington is the only super consistent legitimate deep ball off movement three-point shooting threat and as bad as it's okay for the Pistons to be they're not going to develop which is five guys out there running into each other in the paint because there's no ball you know there's no spacing on the floor having a guy like Ellington out there to space the floor draw gravity draw the defense out hit three-pointers to open up the paint that's something that's important and, and even if you're going to be bad, you need to have some guys that are going to stylistically improve your team on offense and on defense. So you're not just running into each other for 48 minutes and, and you're not just all running into the paint, throwing up tough concept, contested shots, or everyone's just, you know, breaking threes from beyond the arc. So there's some legitimate value in keeping Wayne Ellington and, If I recall, it's a two-year deal anyway, so the Pistons are going to have an opportunity to move Ellington in the offseason if they really choose to. Yeah, it's the 2K-ification of a lot of NBA Twitter where, you know, you set a trade finder and you find value for players and you're just kind of micromanaging guys like that, which – is interesting to introduce it's, it's a nice introduction i guess for for you know basketball fans introduce them to salary cap and some of those basic things but it kind of gives people this impression that everybody's expendable at any moment and the only value is the on-court value and that's just not the that's just not the case and i don't want to turn wayne ellington to some giant microcosm of you know small team nba small small market nba but I think it is a it, it's a good example of you know we we didn't want to move this guy we didn't feel like we could get a good trade for him we'll just keep him he can play out his contract he'll help the young guys out and that will be the contribution moving forward and to us that's worth whatever whatever his contract is um, with Mason Plumley I agreed with you that I thought he was the least likely to be traded and Bigs were apparently just. Nobody was apparently going to trade for a big unless you're the Chicago Bulls. Marcus Aldridge gets bought out. Andre Drummond gets bought out. Can't find deals for either of those guys. So maybe it's just better to just keep triple double maniac Mason Plumlee around with this team and, <laughs> and, you know, let him, let him play out his contract more too. Again, as these contracts lessen in, in years, it's going to be easier to move them. So you're going to get more and more, um, interested teams where they're going to be on shorter contracts, shorter money guaranteed, things like that. So I, you know, if you would have told me two weeks ago, would I be disappointed if they didn't move Wayne Ellington and or Mason Plumlee and or DeLon Wright? I would have been disappointed if they hadn't moved two of those guys, but now 
I'm fine with DeLon Wright being moved, and I am fine with Wayne Ellington not being moved, and I'm not surprised that Mason Plumlee wasn't moved either. I think that's just the a, a fair way to put it. I, I understand there being some level of disappointment, but at the end of the day, even if any of those guys you know were traded, they weren't going to be franchise altering moves anyway. You're probably, again, talking about maybe – a second round pick, which obviously that just there wasn't a strong enough offer there, and that's why it didn't happen. It's it, it those moves are not what's going to hamper the Pistons in their rebuild. It, it it's going to be bigger moves down the line when it comes to drafting, re-signing, extending, trading, you know, bigger names, higher quality things of that regard. Are you disappointed they didn't make more moves? No, I'm not, and. I think our talk over the last 10 minutes just kind of explains why. And what I really just previously said is, is exactly why these aren't franchise altering moves. The Pistons didn't need to make franchise altering moves at this trade deadline. They have some other things that they need to figure out. And it's going to start this off season in July with the draft. But right now there was no need for them to go out and make a big move. The only big move they could have maybe had made was Jeremy Grant and trading and moving on from him. But that might not be the best decision. And maybe there wasn't a strong enough offer there. Whatever it may be, not disappointed that the Pistons didn't make a big move because there was no need for them to make a big move right now. Yeah, I, I, I'm not disappointed either. I thought the whole trading deadline as a whole was kind of boring slash disappointing. Uh, the buyout market was much more intriguing and interesting. And we can run through some of the other trades real quickly here while we're on our trade deadline recap. Um, Aaron, what was the most impactful move to you that was that was made? Like who, oh, I don't want to say who is the winner. I want to say like, what what's the most impactful move? It's got to be the player that I predicted that he would go there in our previous <laughs> podcast. And when I saw that Aaron Gordon got traded to the Denver Nuggets, I immediately texted you and I said, or maybe I, maybe I tweeted it. Yeah. And I said, didn't I say this? And like, I, I just you had did. credit for that. I mean, I had other people, my buddies text me and they're like, you're acting like that was an uh, unexpected move. Like that was something that people were talking about, whatever. Um, no, I think that's a huge trade for Denver. It replaces the gap that Jeremy Grant left when Detroit signed him. Yep. Uh, He's a guy that's going to complement Nikolai Jokic in the front court very, very well. He's going to play defense. He provided some better playmaking for Orlando this year, some better three-point shooting for them. So if he can bring that to Denver, that will certainly help as well. But they desperately needed another forward alongside Michael Porter Jr. You know, Paul Millsap just coming back from injury. He's a guy that had been playing some pretty decent basketball, but his health and if he was going to be able to keep up his level play was certainly a question mark because he has definitely uh, taken a few steps back in terms of uh, level of play over the past couple of seasons. So they needed another guy in the front court. Gordon provides that immensely. It's a big get for Denver as they, you know, solidify their team for the playoffs. Yep. You called it. You called it. Um, Boston Celtics unable to come up with a trade for Aaron Gordon. In classic Boston Celtics fashion, they were just one or two pieces short. They instead get Evan Fournier. Um, I think the most impactful move from a perspective of the Eastern Conference here, obviously, is the Bulls getting Nikola Vucevic. And that really impacts the Cavs and the Pistons as well as the Bulls. I mean, not only are we going to see Vucevic for probably a while in the Central Division here, but the Orlando Magic have determined that they're going to hit the reset button, not just hit it, like smash it with a hammer because they moved basically everybody. They moved Vooch. They moved Evan Fournier. They moved Aaron Gordon, obviously. And that impacts the Pistons because that is a team that should sink like a stone, yet they beat the LA Clippers, uh, of course, yesterday without Paul George. Um, but they still had Kawhi Leonard. There's no reason that the Clippers should have lost that game. So that is a team that should sink like a stone in the standings. That's another tank team that could easily increase the ping pong balls uh, for the lottery, which is on the 22nd of June. 
So that's impactful for the Pistons. That, that might be the most impactful move that the Pistons were a part of is Orlando just becoming a tank fest. And, you know, they could interrupt the, uh, the wonderful tanking that was happening in Detroit. Um, they could sneak in and, you know, steal a pick and move ahead of the Pistons. So I'll say the Bulls move was the most impactful from a Orlando magic being terrible and altering the lottery potentially and the Bulls getting Vucevic and will probably stick around in the central division for a while and the Pistons will have to face him. Okay, so that's that's sort of going to be our wrap up for the trading deadline. There's a lot more on the, that happened on the bio market with Aldridge going to the Nets and Andre Drummond going to the Lakers. Well, there were a lot of small moves that happened at the deadline. I don't know if they're necessarily important to talk about. Um, were there any that you wanted to touch on? I think the big ones were the Aaron Gordon and, and Nikola Vucevic trades. Uh, you know, certainly a trade like Detroit is pretty minor. I can't think of any other moves off the top of my head that had implications like an Aaron Gordon trade where that really helps Denver as a competing team and solidifies them. And the Vucevic trade gives Chicago uh, another guy to play with Zach Levine as they try to put together a winning team. We'll see if they can legitimately do it. And I'm not sure that that roster fits the best, but it's their attempt at putting together a winning team. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the Pistons going to get Blake Griffin as let's just go get talent and interesting we'll make it work. Um, but off the top of my head, there really weren't many other big moves at the deadline that are going to have a, a, a big impact. More, more along lines of what was like, what didn't happen. Like Kyle Lowry didn't get moved. That, that was, that was, it's such that a weird, weird situation in Toronto too, because they played the Pistons earlier this week and they just played so bad and looked so dejected and looked so out of it. And I don't know if it's being in Tampa. I don't know if it's not being in Toronto. That's having a, a, a rather large effect on them, but they just all look so miserable. Like I honestly felt bad for them because they just don't look happy. Lowry was a wreck, and he was not effective, and he didn't play well. Obviously, Siakam had that altercation with Nick Nurse a few weeks ago, so that's a lingering issue for that team. Sure. They just traded a beloved teammate in Norm Powell, and, and Gary Trent just looks really weird, and I think it's like number 33. Uh, it, it just – it all looks bad in, it, with Toronto right now. I was – I mean, Lowry was – already had like a good buy post posted essentially – and yeah. he didn't end up getting moved. I, I was just totally shocked to see that happen. But, you know, the, in, in kind of the same sense of we're not just going to get Absolutely. rid of this guy for nothing, I think that's Masai Ujiri saying, look, like I'm getting value for my guy if I'm going to move on from him because he, he provides value. So, you know, I respect yeah. that as well in the same ilk of not trading Wayne Ellington or not buying out Wayne Ellington because you weren't able to trade him for what you wanted. Uh, so I think uh, certainly on a larger scale with Kyle, Kyle Lowry, but I think Masai Ujiri kind of, you know, using that same type of mentality. I was shocked to not see Lowry move because it sounded like he was going to the Lakers or he was going to Philly or he was going to Miami. Yep. It was just a uh, pick your spot essentially. Right. And, and, you know, I don't, I also don't mind it. They can sign and trade him this off season. They could just let him walk. I, I don't think that they're just going to let him walk. They're going to, I'm sure they're going to try and do a sign and trade and get something for him. But I was also surprised not to see him moved. I kind of had a feeling he wasn't going to get moved as soon as the Sixers got George Hill. I kind of thought, okay, that takes one very prominent team out of the race. They, you know, they probably know something. And to, you know, to credit the Sixers, they didn't give up. Matisse Thibel or Tyrese Maxey and a pick and, you know, Danny Green. And, you know, they didn't gouge their roster for Kyle Lowry. So obviously they must feel a certain way about some of those players, which, you know, credit to Daryl Morey for not emptying the cabinet for Kyle Lowry. But yeah, that was a very, very weird sort of, you know, it got to two o'clock and like, okay, here it comes. It got to three and like, well, any, any minute now, three forty-five, and like, okay, really, really any minute now. And then four and you're like, okay, People are still quiet. We got like a Marquise Chris trade at the end and 
everyone was probably waiting for the Lowry train, just never came through. So yeah, it was a very uh, wait and see deadline that turned out to be just a lot of waiting and then not a whole lot of seeing any real action. Yeah, it was. So let's go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to kind of wrap it up by saying, I think there was a lot of talk about this deadline where there were some players that were supposed to be locks to be on the move and it just didn't happen. Right. It kind of feels like a lot of deadline, you know, at least in the past years are starting to feel that way where there's a lot of names there. It's like, oh, these guys are on the move. It's just a matter of where and they don't end up getting moved. So just something to maybe think about and when you're, you know, next year for the trade deadline, but I, that won't be the case. We'll all be talking about the 4 million trades that are definitely going to happen just for there to be 10. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So we will move on from trade deadline talk to uh, back to some Pistons talk and the early returns of Hamadou Diallo. He had kind of had a brief, I don't know how many games he missed when he was traded here. He was dealing with uh, an injury plus the trade happened. So uh, his Pistons debut was a little bit delayed, but so far the returns for Diallo are pretty promising uh, and kind of makes me wonder why the heck the Thunder even traded him in the first place. I don't really understand, but 12 and a half point, six rebounds. He does bring a certain level of intensity that makes me think, you know, he's the shooting guard moving forward. He's young. He brings sort of what you're looking for. And he's not a shooter. Um, well, let's just go right from there. He, he's, he's not a shooter. He's a rim pressure sort of guy with a level of intensity and athleticism that is not taught. Um, but what do you think about Hamadou Diallo early on here? Yeah, I like what I see from Hamadou Diallo. I, I think he brings a, he plays with his emotions on his sleeve and he plays at a very intense level. I like that he stepped in game one and was willing to, you know, mix it up with Blake Griffin, like the rest of the Pistons were as soon as he stepped out onto the court, you know, even though he didn't have that same relationship with Blake Griffin as some of the players that actually played with him did, you know, he went out there and he mixed it up with them and he was out there kind of, you know, in the, in the, inside the lines, inside the battle with, with his teammates. And I appreciated that. And I respected that. And, now he makes some nice plays. He's a confident and aggressive slasher. He will go at the rim and, and, and try to attack it, uh, bring it down, whatever, however you want to phrase it. He's very aggressive when it comes to slashing. I like that he has some you know, ball handling skills as a two guard. What I will say is to, I guess, be the negative Nancy, is unless Diallo is able to develop some form of three-point shooting he is he he just won't be able to be the shooting guard of detroit's future because you know he is is a very bad three-point shooter uh in terms of his two seasons in the league both sub 30 percent seasons Uh, so there is a lot of room for growth not saying it can't happen he's just 22 years old so if he develops a three-point shot it becomes a completely different story with him but until then i can't legitimately take him as a threat to be the shooting guard of the future, especially with a draft coming up where two of the top three or four prospects are shooting guards. Uh, So I like what I've seen from him. I'm not trying to take away uh, from him in that regard, but I want to dial it back a little bit because I see a lot of Twitter acting like the Pistons just got another all-star prospect and it's all about perspective, bringing things back to reality not trying to overreact to a trade because the Thunder wouldn't just give up this, you know, all-star level prospect for Svima Hailuk and the second round pick that's six years away. Um, again, that's not to say Diallo is a bad player. He could end up being the shooting guard of the future and he has played pretty well since, you know, coming here, even though it's only been a couple of games, that second game for him was just really, really promising where he really took over for that team when he came in the game everything changed for Detroit. They play with a lot more energy, a lot more intensity, a lot more pace. That's something that is really exciting. And I'm interested to see how the rest of this season goes. There's certainly an opportunity for him to play out there. I think seeing how he fits alongside Killian Hayes will be very, very interesting. 
because those two have what I think are some complementary skill sets in terms of Diallo's passing and finishing ability and Killian's playmaking ability. Those two could really kind of form a nice duo, I think. So I'm excited to see that. Overall, the returns on Diallo are very, very promising so far. Do you think that the early returns being promising is a product of really no shooting guard necessarily on the team? I think it's it's just a gaping hole there. I think it's helped that Josh Jackson has kind of played himself out of the rotation. Yeah. And, you know, Wayne Ellington's only going to play so much when he's playing, you know, and, and when he's healthy and whatnot. I think that's certainly a byproduct uh, that has allowed Diallo to succeed. But, you know, he, to be fair, when given the opportunity, he's gone out there and made the plays. You know, he's done his job. He's not gone out there and underperformed. Uh, You know, he's gone out there and capitalized on that opportunity. Right. Yeah, it it will be interesting, like you said, to see how he – plays with Killian Hayes, which hopefully will be in the near future. Can it be hopefully. soon? Because I feel like I feel like for like the last two weeks it's been all right, you know, we should get that update that Killian's gonna be playing in a day or two, you know, at, at any given point. And still nothing on that regard. So maybe I'm just thinking ahead of schedule and maybe it's gonna be next week, but it feels like he should be back considering every you know the timeline that was discussed. Yeah, let's hope it's soon because it's April 1st tomorrow. Um, somehow, I remember talking about the doldrums of January. And here it's April 1st and baseball's opening day uh, already. So I hope it's soon um, because when we talked about the Pistons preview way back at the beginning of the season, we sort of hinged a lot of the returns for the season in general on what Killian Hayes looks like with X player or X players and to not have anything other than a handful of games from him where he looked really bad and just about all of them, that would be really disappointing to have basically a lost season. That's not to say that the Pistons haven't learned a lot about their core already, but you, I mean, he right now is the linchpin. Killian Hayes is like the linchpin of the rebuild. That's who you hedged yourself on, you know, to build around. Teams are building around point guards. Teams used to build around centers and bigs. Now they build around point guards. So you've drafted your point guard, your point guard of the future. It'd be nice to see what he looks like. And Diallo is, like you say, he's only 22. That's a, that's one of the guys that you would like to think is part of the future. You want to see him play with the other part of the future. So hopefully he does come back soon. But, yeah, unless Diallo – develops a shot or even a threat of three-point shooting, he is going to be capped in what he can provide. That's not to say he's not going to be useful as a bench piece, but, and you did an excellent segue, there are a, there are shooting guards at the top of the NBA draft that would immediately slot into that role at, at the two guard and impact the game in a way that you would want a shooting guard to do and they can do it better than Diallo can. And that sort of puts us into our NCAA tournament uh, lottery pick talk, a couple of potential Pistons prospects. So Kate Cunningham, Evan Mobley, Jalen Suggs, one of those players is still playing. Jonathan Kuminga is in the the G League. That's another guy. Um, Aaron, what do you think about, first of all, how much of the tourney have you watched? Watched a fair amount of it. I, I honestly, I would have liked to watch more as it's gone on. The first couple of days, I, I I really buckled down and watched as much of it as I can or could. Um, I've watched you know a lot of the games as of late. Obviously, I watched the very unfortunate Michigan game uh, last night, which I, I really don't want to get into because Michigan should have beaten that UCLA team, but. Again, yes, it cost me fifty thousand dollars, so I'm also very unhappy at uh, Michigan. Now you're gonna have to go. You're gonna have to explain that a little bit. <laughs> you can't just say, "Well, you know, it cost me fifty G," but continue with what you're saying. You're gonna have to give us a little bit more on that. So, in my in my work uh, setting, 
have some sports fans. We bet on the Masters and we bet on the NCAA tournament. And we bet on other um, golf majors. And this time we decided to do a survivor pool with one of my coworkers, uh, DraftKings accounts. And there were a couple thousand entries. The winner gets 50,000. If there's ties, it gets split up amongst the winners. And we were down to the last like 70. We were in the last 70 in the survivor pool with a good chance to win. So just to go over the survivor pool really briefly, I don't know if you've ever done one before, but you have to pick. So the first couple of rounds, you have to pick a winner a day but you can't pick them again later on. So you want to pick teams that you think are only going to last in a, like a round or two. Right. Like we picked Iowa. Good pick. <laughs> Good pick. Uh, Iowa did not go far. We picked Arkansas against Oral Roberts. That was almost a complete travesty as Oral Roberts nearly destroyed that, but Arkansas hung on. So it makes you think about, you know, you want guys or teams rather who are going to win in that round, but might not win again. Yeah. You don't want to pick a Gonzaga. You don't want to pick a Baylor. You don't want to pick a, you know, we didn't want to pick a Michigan until the later parts of the tournament. So we were down to the final 70 and looking at some of the other entries, we were in good shape. Some of those other entries already picked Gonzaga. So Gonzaga, they, you know, they couldn't pick them again. They already picked Baylor and we picked Michigan over UCLA. But how could Michigan blow it? They looked so dominant against Florida state with that high, low action and Franz Wagner looking great. And then they blew it. <laughs> they split up 49 points against UCLA and good for UCLA going from first four to final four. That's very cool. Also, I hate you UCLA uh, for ruining that opportunity for 50 K. Cause that just flew out the window. My condolences. That's, I mean, that sounds like a, a roller coaster type of thing to be in more so it's than awesome. a it was so fun. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to hear that because I bet that 50 G's would have, would have been uh, pretty nice. Uh, maybe, maybe you could have built that little bad. podcast studio to, to kind of meet halfway <laughs> and record it in person. Uh, yes, absolutely. But it was very interesting to, cause okay. Everyone's bracket was toast after the first day. As soon as Ohio State lost to Oral Roberts, mm-hmm. toast. Illinois loses to Loyola, toast. I mean, you're just barbecue chicken at that point. So, the survivor pool at least lets you, you know, it gives you a little bit of a cushion for the first couple of rounds. Then it gets pretty, pretty tough. And you got to pick the two final four teams and the champion and you had to have not pick them before. So it, you know, it does, it, it, it is very challenging, but you know, we were, Oh, so close. We just needed that Michigan win. Then we could have picked Baylor and then we could have picked Gonzaga and that would have done it. We would have won. Wow, that's tough. I'm sorry to hear that. That's tough. That's okay. That's okay. I mean, hey, fifty thousand dollars, thousand thousands. We were lucky we made it that far. So, um, but, but turning back to the lotto pick talk for the Pistons, um, Kate Cunningham, Evan Mobley, Jalen Suggs. You listed these three in the notes. I think. Can we agree? Kate Cunningham is the number one pick. You get the number one pick. You take Kate Cunningham, right? I think more and more people are starting to explore other options. I'm still locked in on Cade Cunningham at one. I am too. I think he unlocks so much um, with his ability to defend one through three, maybe even one through four, his playmaking ability. And I'm really not worried about the shot making either. I think that's a guy that unlocks a lot for a number of teams. He'd certainly unlock a lot on the Cavaliers and he should be the consensus number one pick if Detroit gets the number one pick. So let's just assume that he is the consensus number one pick. You get the number one pick, you take Kid Cunningham. What about if you get the number two pick? Yeah, this is tough because it's a little hard. I really do like Evan Mobley, but at the beginning of the year, first game I watched was Gonzaga, and right away Jalen Suggs stole the show and intrigued me and he's had a a pretty nice tournament didn't have to you know have a big game against Norfolk State but other than that he's had you know three pretty effective games certainly looks like this is what you know this is definitely their their NBA prospect this is a top top lottery guy like I really really like him but to be fair Mobley himself had a really good tournament Scoring wise, rebounding wise, 
you know, playmaking wise. I mean, he had a, f- a five assists against Kansas, six assists against Oregon. You know, he did himself a good job in, in keeping his stock high with a strong tournament. And I, I really like him. I, I, I just, I, I'm really more of a guard guy. I, I care more about getting a guard rather than a center. And it, it, we kind of talked about, you know, maybe Diallo is the shooting guard of the future, but there are going to be shooting guard options when the Pistons are on the clock, whether it be Cunningham or Suggs or Jalen Green. You know, there are going to be options for Detroit. And I really like what I have seen from Suggs. He seems like a guy that would complement Hayes really, really well. I I think if I had to make the pick. Kate Cunningham's off the board. I'm number two on the clock. I'm taking Jalen Suggs. Oh, okay. I like it. I I... I really do. And I get the Evan Mobley thing. I really do. He is good. He is very, he has great awareness on both sides of the floor. He's a seven footer. He is going to be a very good player. Um, I kind of agree though. And for the same reason we talked about building around bigs, it's just not a thing that really happens anymore. You build around wings and point guards, mostly, you know, ideally a guy who could do wing and point guard duties. And Jalen Suggs makes a lot of sense. Jalen Green makes a lot of sense too. He's a little taller. He's a little lankier. Um, But I really like Jalen Suggs. I think he fits super well and would fit super well next to Killian Hayes. That's two crafty guards. And, you know, hopefully, again, let's see what Hayes looks like when he comes back, which is another reason to get him back and see him on the court because you need to see what you have post-injury. Um, but I do like Jalen Suggs a lot. I still like Jonathan Kuminga. I mean, if the Pistons fall out of the top four, really, if they don't get Suggs, Green, Mobley, or Kate Cunningham, yikes. I mean, that's not a – that does not look good. No, that – it makes it pretty bad for the Pistons. It puts them in a situation that they certainly don't want to be in. No. Because this draft, I mean, I'm looking at Tankathon right now, and I see Scotty Barnes at seven, and I'm not a big Scotty Barnes guy. I see Jalen Johnson at six. Uh, I don't know about Jalen Johnson. I see Corey Kispert at eight. I like Corey Kispert. He does some nice things. But at eight, no way. No, no how. No thank yeah. you. I see front. Not that the Pistons will be at 12, but I see Franz Wagner at 12. I'm a Michigan guy. There's no way in hell I'm taking Franz Wagner in the lottery. And, and, and that's the problem. That little bit of recency bias off of the no, completely airmailed three. No, I, I, the thing is, I think Franz Wagner is a <laughs> decent player, but there's just no way he's a lottery pick. Like, the shooting is a concern. The – You know, just overall aggressiveness on offense is a concern. That's a guy that needed to step up with Isaiah Livers going down, and he just kind of faded into the background. He is not – I'm worried about him offensively. I think defensively he's actually a pretty good prospect, um, but I'm just not touching him in the lottery. No no thank you. And I'm a Michigan guy, so that's – you know, if anything, I I should be saying 5 to 12, absolutely. Get him in the top 10, but no, I – I'm not touching him in the lottery. Yeah, and the top four, you know, I maybe maybe top five. I like Jonathan Kaminga. Yes. Maybe top five. But I'm looking at draft net, and I see the Cavs at six with Scotty Barnes, and that's sort of the threshold where I'm like, eh, Yeah. Yeah, I kind of kind need a top five pick. And I think the Pistons will get a top five pick. If they don't get a top five pick, it's, a, it's just a travesty. But – I think they will, but yeah, you, you hit the six, you get six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, I'm I'm looking at NBA draft net. Scotty Barnes, Moses Moody. I think you like Moses Moody. Keon Johnson, Corey Kispert at nine, and then Kai Jones at ten. I don't know. First, I don't know why the Pelicans would be drafting a setter on NBA draft net, but oh well. And then Franz Wagner at eleven. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, this this gets uh, ugly after five, I think, because again, I'm not huge on Barnes or Johnson. I think Kispert's not worth a lottery pick. Maybe a guy like James Bonite from UConn, you know, I do like him. Pretty effective for them. Yeah. Uh it but it it gets let's say dicey. It gets dicey after the top five. You would rather not be there. No, absolutely, you would, absolutely. You would rather not be there. Yeah. If if the Pistons or Cavs are outside the top five, we're gonna be having some conversations about what the hell do you do now. We're gonna have a really angry, really angry lottery show if they if oh, they but, end up outside of the, if both of them end up outside the top five. Yeah, you know, let's just let's just let's just imagine that doesn't happen. Yeah, let's manifest the opposite of that, which is where they're both in the top five and you feel okay about everything. Um, yeah, so Kate Cunningham, I, I definitely feel like should be one. Evan Mobley, I think, shouldn't be two, but if Detroit picked him at two, I don't think I would entirely be upset about that. I, I Like I said, I do think he's going to be good, and you know, this is all information that will be a lot better during our draft pod that eventually we will have with people who, who have watched more college basketball than us because I have not watched enough college basketball to make an educated decision on most of these players outside of the top 10. Um, but I like Jalen Green. I like Jalen Suggs. I think either one of those, if Detroit falls outside of the top two, I wouldn't mind either of them. And I wouldn't mind Jonathan Kuminga, who's much taller. He's at 6'8", compared to Jalen Suggs at 6'4". So does different things, too. Um, but was there anything in the tourney of those players? Honestly, I, I mean, obviously, Green and Kuminga are exceptions since they're not in the tournament. They're in the G League. Any other uh, standout performances in the tournament that you think should be on Pistons fans' um, uh, draft analysis uh, worksheets as, as we as we get ready to figure out what the lottery is, uh, you know, hopefully going to be? Yeah, I'm – you know, it's funny. A, a lot of the the big name guys either weren't in the tournament or went down rather early. So you look at a guy like Keon Johnson and, and Jaden Springer from Tennessee. You know, obviously Jalen Johnson didn't get to play in the tournament. A lot of those guys, and then you mix in Jalen Green and Jonathan Kamingo, who are both in the G League. So a lot of those guys, you know, around the top ten in, in most lottery drafts weren't in the tournament. Uh, so I, I think the biggest thing that I saw from the tournament and the reaction and the recency bias is people saw Kate Cunningham one go down early and two not have the best games. And meanwhile saw guys like Mobley and Suggs go further and have better performances. And that's why I think you're starting to see some other guys start to find their way into the mix, at least maybe not in mock drafts, but in people's opinions of well, maybe a team should take Jalen Suggs first, or maybe a team should take Evan Mobley first because Cade struggled in the tournament and this and that. So that recency bias is certainly a factor, uh, but it's just clear as day, Cade is still the number one guy in my opinion. Yeah, and I don't have any examples on hand of big tournament performances that lead to success in the NBA or lack of – certainly didn't work NBA. out that way for Mitch McGarry. <laughs> throwback that's true it that guy pops he... into my mind like at least once every like six months like just thinking about oh, dude that guy was going to be so good get the yeah. classic Stephen a stay off the weed right yeah, like, right I wish i could have played that right there we need a soundboard or uh what's his face uh so who sauce castillo oh man it just left my mind uh, he played for the Kings and the Cavs. He, he even played for the Cavs. He plays overseas. Nick Stauskas? Too. Yeah, it's Nick Stauskas. Duh. Nick Stauskas. Good tournament. Uh, God, Nothing those, after that, though. It's okay. The Michigan boys that are still in the NBA today are, are, are good. Shout out Karis LeVert. Yes. The not Houston Rocket Karis LeVert. That, uh, we're going to look back at that James Harden trade sometime down in the future and just – Oh, you know what? That's a trade that we didn't really talk about. We didn't talk about Victor Oladipo. The I was heat. just going to say that. I wanted to look to see because I literally have not heard a thing about him since he got he, to Miami. Has he played yet? He, he has a head cold and has not suited up yet. He's uh, dodging the Indiana Pacers, who yeah, I believe I was going to say, like, 
I know Miami got him, but since they traded for, for him, nothing. I have not heard a word about him. Not not just got him. They got him for Avery Bradley and the guy who ripped Kevin Love's arm out of the socket and a pick swap. They really got him for nothing. I mean, quite frankly, the fact that, and I know that Raphael Stone was asked, would you do the Oladipo trade again? He said yes, because he's not going to say no. <laughs> right. He's, he's, he's not going to tell the media, yeah, that, that was a terrible trade. Of course, he's going to say yes. They got nothing for Victor Oladipo, and he can help the Miami Heat. I think he can do some stuff that, that would actually help them. Um, and they got him for two corpses and a pick swap. You know, good for Houston for getting a pick swap, but I hate to break it to you. If you could have Karis LeVert and or Jared Allen, and you end up with nothing really close to that, I mean, Kevin Porter Jr. looks pretty good. You picked him up from Cleveland for a top 59 protected pick. <laughs> um, I actually think that's exactly what it is. I think it's a top 59 protected pick is what – is all I have to give up, but that's great. You know, hang, hang your hat on that, but the James Harden trade sort of is starting to just look really horrible for the Houston Rockets. It was going to be tough to win that trade anyway, but they just really did themselves in by not going to Philadelphia and getting Ben Simmons and Tyrese Maxey. Is James Harden involved in the two worst trades in NBA history? So that one and when he was traded to Houston. <laughs> what an okay I mean, They got like Jeremy Lamb. I'm trying to think. They got like Lamb back. They got a pick that turned into Steven Adams. Okay. We That's can look this up real quick as our last thing that we uh, – I mean – As okay, the last thing that we do. We get anything of – Kevin Martin. Turned out into anything, you know, of, of serious magnitude. I mean, Adams, to be fair – Adams ended up having an, a, a, a pretty productive tenure in Oklahoma City. You know, he he was certainly solid for them, but I mean, you're just not gonna, you're never gonna equal out value for a generational player. And James Harden is a generational player. It's really as simple as that. Unless you're getting back six first round picks and you're gonna hit on them, you're just not going to get equal value. This is the best way to end this podcast. This will be the last thing that we cover. So just to wrap up, the Rockets get James Harden. They also got Daquan Cook, shout out Ohio State, and Lazar Laser Hayward. Lazar Hayward. Jesus. The Thunder get Kevin Martin, Jeremy Lamb, a 2013 first round pick that was Stephen Adams, a, and a second round pick that was Alex Abrinas, and that and a 2014 first round draft pick that became Mitch McGarry. Ah! <laughs> Mitch McGarry, man, I'm telling you, that guy was that that guy took his tournament run and was about to cash out, but couldn't stay off the weed. That is the best way to end that podcast. Is a Mitch McGarry wraparound segment. Um, okay, so yes, that is a. That's a that's a really horrible trade. So James Harden is quite quite actually involved in the two worst trades in NBA history. Um, okay, so Aaron, anything else that you want to cover um, after after that segment, that that impromptu segment? No, you you said it ended perfectly. Let's let's leave it perfect. I, I'm, I'm I think it ended now. perfectly. I'm all good now. <laughs> yes, it, it ended perfectly. So. That will do it for this edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. Thank you very much for joining us. I am your host, Mike Ang- Mike Angolano. And as always, I'm with Aaron Johnson. Thank you all so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time.